county of Devon prides itself on having something to appeal to all visitors from the rugged coastline of North Devon, which contrasts with family-packed sandy beaches to sheltered coves and inlets in the south. Sandwiched between the coastlines are the many and varied landscapes of the moors, Dartmoor and Exmoor, which can be lush and beautiful at one point, yet stark and dramatic only a few miles away. Built astride an old Roman road, the original town of Honiton has stood here since about the 13th century. Here are attractive alleyways, courtyards and a straight road of the high street and a variety of antique and other small shops all set amongst the Georgian buildings which are a delight for tourists. All Hallows Museum is housed in Honiton's oldest building, a 13th century chapel. This is where examples of famous Honiton lace can be found, together with lace making demonstrations, as well as examples of the town's clock making and pottery industries. Many people have heard the name of Axminster when looking at quality carpets and probably haven't realised that it's from this pleasant town in Devon that they originate. Thomas Whitty founded the industry in 1755 and many of his carpets have graced mansions and palaces. This busy market town is situated around the central Trinity Square, but actually it is triangular in shape, overlooked by the large church the Minster Church of St Mary the Virgin. The town also features a museum and the old police house. At the very old village of Axmouth, the Roman Foss Way crossed the wide river Axe. The village was well established by the 7th century. Today, attractive thatched cottages surround St Michael's Church, built in Norman times. Once an important port, the harbour can now only be used by small craft. The popular holiday resort of Seaton lies on the west side of the River Axe estuary near the Devon-Dorset border. This sedate seaside town with its mixture of Victorian and modern buildings has views of cliffs to the west across the large bay. An enjoyable scenic route can be taken on the Seaton Tramway alongside the River Axe with its abundance of wildlife up to the historic town of Collerton. Sheltered by the most westerly chalk cliffs in England is the tiny fishing village of Beer, which has contrasting claims to fame. Beer lace making was once an industry established here by refugees from the Netherlands. This lace was used in Queen Victoria's wedding dress. Devon's most notorious smuggler, Jack Rattenbury, was born here in 1778. After various escapades at sea, including crossing the Atlantic, his vessel was captured by the French. When returning to Beer, he found life boring and consequently found excitement in smuggling. Along the south coast is the village of Branscombe. The beach, approached by a narrow lane, nestles between the formidable cliffs in a sheltered bay. The village stretches along one of the prettiest coombs in the southwest. Cream teas are a speciality of the area. This gorgeous village is reputed to be one of the longest in the country. Enchanting thatched cottages line the roadside, making it one of the prettiest in the area. The ancient St Winifred's Church dates back to just after the Norman Conquest. A priest lived in the church tower priest's room in days gone by. Regency architecture can be seen in the unspoilt resort of Sidmouth. 
It's been favoured by royal patronage in the early 19th century and is a quiet and genteel resort. To its credit, it remains free from extensive amusement arcades and noisy nightlife, and to many people, this is its attraction. In August, musicians, dancers and singers from all over the world arrive for the International Folk Festival. A quiet, restful resort is Budley Salterton. It was a place of royal visits in Georgian and Victorian times. Salt panning was an industry here in the past, hence the Salterton part of the name. The historical city of Exeter is a fascinating place with its spectacular cathedral dating from the 12th century. In the 14th century, the West Front with its prophets, soldiers and medieval figures of apostles was built. Boats from around the world are featured in the Maritime Museum, displayed around the quay in old warehouse buildings. Exeter's medieval prosperity came mainly from the trade that passed through the port until the Countess of Devon, Lady Isabel, in 1290, commissioned a weir to be built. Thus, the port trade diminished, resulting in a 300-year legal case. In medieval times, the River X flowed through this now-preserved area. In 1564, the five-and-a-half-mile canal was built to revitalise the trade. The mouth of the River X was the site of a medieval settlement and port. Exmouth evolved as a seaside resort during the 18th century, when a development of elegant Georgian houses called the Beacon were built. A two-mile seafront stretches from the harbour area to the Red Cliffs at Orkham Point. Across the estuary from Exmouth is Cockwood, a small seaside village in South Devon, which at first glance seems like so many others you may find, with its stone harbour, fishing boats, pleasure craft and local inn. Unlike other villages, the mainline railway line to Torquay passes along its coastal route at the front of the harbour. The railway continues its scenic route alongside the beach at the traditional seaside resort of Dawlish, once a place of residence for Charles Dickens and Jane Austen. In times gone by, the railway could have been a popular way of getting to the seaside. As modern locomotives roar past, one can only imagine the inspiring sight of steam engines, which used to use this line. Elsewhere in the town, one will find Regency buildings and famous landscape gardens, known simply as the Lawn. These gardens are beautifully situated between two naturally running streams and are a haven for wildlife. The town of Tynmouth, with its distinctive red sandy beach, has long been a popular family resort. Incorporating the old-fashioned pier, the beach and traditional entertainment, it really has something to keep the whole family entertained on sunny afternoons. The quay, which in the past shipped out Dartmoor granite, still remains working today with shipyards and the fish market. This provides a tangible link to the past of this small seaside town.
In the background, a narrow bridge can be seen which links the picturesque village of Sheldon with Tynmouth. From the beach at Sheldon, with its backdrop of red cliffs, you can get some stunning views out across the estuary. A large bay formed by this part of Devon's coastline is known as Babacombe Bay. It provides a variety of opportunities for water-based activities. This ends in the beach at Babacombe, the last small beach before Torquay. Maiden Coombe nestles near the shore of Babacombe Bay. The beautiful thatched tavern found here is typical of the traditional buildings in this area. The 22 miles of coastline known as Torbay is in fact made up of three towns, Torquay, Paynton and Brixham, each displaying a slightly different character. Torquay, on the eastern headland, is arguably the grander of the three and has an almost continental feel to it. It's known as the English Riviera, with ranks of hotels towering above the coastline. The warm climate found here has led to a growth of lush subtropical vegetation, including palm trees, which are bathed in coloured lights during the summer season. There are a number of beaches in Torquay. The fact that they are spread out, and there are so many of them, mean that they seldom seem crowded, despite Torquay being the second most popular seaside resort in Britain. The centre of the town is based around the marina and harbour, and the copper-domed Edwardian Pavilion, originally a ballroom, with attractive fountains playing in the sunlight. Torquay has a history dating back thousands of years. Stone Age Man once lived in Kent's cavern, which can be found one mile away from the present harbour. In the caves, evidences of simple tools have been discovered, as well as remains of creatures such as sabre-toothed tigers, mammoths and bears. More recently, in the 12th century, monks from northern France founded Tor Abbey. These monks fished the bay and built the quay from which Torquay takes its name. The use of the harbour has changed over the years and, as well as fishing boats, is now a haven for luxury cruisers and yachts. Torquay has also been made famous by the annual Cows, Torquay Offshore Powerboat Race. Paynton is a popular family resort. It has grown quickly in the last century and boasts many hotels and guest houses within walking distance of some of the best beaches in the southwest. A water park, steam railway and zoo all compete for the many visitors. Brixham, on the western headland of Torbay, is the town least influenced by tourism. Here, the fish and chip shops blend with the harbour. There are also numerous colourful fishing vessels, making it a popular spot for painters. 
There is a full-size replica of the Golden Hind, Sir Francis Drake's famous flagship in the Old Harbour, reinforcing the fact that this is very much a seafaring community. Once known as the Great Fishery of the West, where in fact the local fishermen of the 18th century developed the technique of trawling, a net is dragged along the bottom of the sea to catch the fish. The old market house by the harbour contains the British Fisheries Museum. In all weathers and all seasons of the year, the toil of the fishermen is endless and as the light fades and the catch is offloaded under the watchful eye of the ever-present seagulls. Strict regulations are enforced on the fishermen for size, species and quotas and a proportion of the catch may have to be returned to the sea. Catches are still sold in the fish market beside the Stone Harbour. If fresh fish is your penchant, this is the place to be. Torbay's sole is a fine fish and regularly appears on menus in local Drinks. hotels. Yeah. The Brixham Museum follows the town's maritime adventures over the past nine centuries and also the Coast Guard service. Nearby, one is able to find peaceful beaches in Berry Head Country Park, a beautiful nature reserve. Moving away from Torbay and south along the coast to Dartmouth, which as its name suggests is located at the mouth of the River Dart, with steep green hills found on either side of the estuary. Dartmouth Castle is on the southern side and Kingswear Castle can be seen to the north. Dartmouth Castle is a small castle built in 1481 to protect against sea raids, but it was never harmed and now just provides splendid views of the valley. The centre of Dartmouth is a web of cobbled streets and retains an ancient atmosphere, especially the cobbled quayside. Dartmouth was an important port in medieval times and did a brisk trade with Europe, but by the 17th century had been overtaken by larger ports and since has never benefited from a major road or rail link. The Royal Naval College is situated above the town's harbour. Officers of the Mercantile Marine and Royal Navy are trained here. The dart often provides a lively scene with naval vessels, fishing boats, ferries and pleasure craft all intermingling. The passenger ferry from Dartmouth to King's Weir provides pleasant views and is unusual because of the way the tugboat actually tows the ferry across the river.
The village of Torcross is built partly on the Shingle Bar, seen here. The bar has formed right from Torcross to Slapton Bridge and has hence formed Slapton Lee, Devon's largest freshwater lake. This is now a nature reserve, which is home to a rich and varied wildlife population. As a visitor to this part of Devon, you'll not find it difficult to find numerous shady inlets and secluded beaches, which provide breathtaking scenes of natural beauty interspersed with tiny communities. In the distance can be seen the southernmost extremity of Devon, known as Prawl Point, where the Coast Guard station is located and the rugged coastline is lashed by the full force of the heavy seas. Picturesque Sulcombe is to be found between the Kingsbridge estuary and the coast. It is Devon's most southerly resort. Its deep sheltered harbour is home to many sailing craft as well as the much needed local lifeboat, boat builders and marine engineers. Old wharf houses built on the water's edge run up to a mosaic of tiny alleyways and streets, creating the character of the region. In the summer, Sulcombe and Kingsbridge are linked by a pleasant boat trip along the river. Located on the highest point of Kingsbridge Estuary is the town of Kingsbridge. It has been known as the capital of the South Hams for centuries, but is only a one-street town rising from the quay. For the visitor, there is a 15th century church, a town hall with a peculiarly shaped clock tower, and picturesque back streets and passages to explore. Villages adorn this area, with traditional cottages unchanged for many generations. The relaxed lifestyle is the envy of the visitor. South Pool, with its stream, is a typical example of this. A swift walk along part of the southwest coastal path leads to Bigbury Bay, with its sand dunes and rocky outcrops. Opposite the small village of Bigbury on Sea is Borough Island, which is in fact a rock covering only 28 acres. This becomes an island only at high tide. At low tide, the 282 metre causeway can be covered on foot or by car.
Many inns in Devon are named after the traditional pilchard fishing, one of which is the Pilchard Inn on Borough Island, which, with the Borough Hotel, cater for travellers' needs. Plymouth City Centre today is a very modern affair with the university, shops and other modern buildings vying for attention. Having risen from the ashes like the legendary Phoenix after the terrible bombing raid in February 1941. The investigative tourist can still discover some fine old surviving merchant homes. Plymouth has long been linked with seafaring exploits and the famous Elizabethan explorers and merchants, Hawkins, Raleigh and Sir Francis Drake, all sailing from here. From Plymouth Hoe, meaning high ground, there are fantastic views over the old harbour area, Plymouth Sound with its busy shipping lanes and across to Drake's Island. The busy harbour also bustles with the passing of pleasure trip ferries, sailing boats and ocean-going vessels. Much fortification of Plymouth has taken place over the years, not least the imposing Royal Citadel, built next to the Hoe in the 17th century. The Barbican area of the city near the Old Harbour was originally built as commemoration of the defences, which have disappeared over the years. Towards Yelverton, the scenery changes dramatically to the mysterious granite rocks and heather-covered lands of Dartmoor. Yelverton is situated near the edge of the moor, and here a granite rock provides a natural climbing frame. Ponies and sheep roam freely in the area. The small floral village of Buckland Monocorum has a quiet air, and the public house proudly carries the name of Drake Manor Inn after Sir Francis Drake, who lived at Buckland Abbey, one mile from the village in around 1581. He was famous for his seafaring exploits and was mayor of Plymouth in 1590. The centrepiece is the church, whose bells peal a melodic tune every hour. The attractive stone cottages line the main street, many of which date from the 17th century. Towards the centre of the moor is Princetown, made famous by Dartmoor Prison, as bleak and dark as ever. The prison, dominating the village, was built in 1806 to house French prisoners captured in the Napoleonic Wars. The grim conditions and overcrowding led to many deaths. Today it is still used and holds around 600 inmates. A sobering thought for many potential criminals. Princetown itself claims to be the highest town in England and in spite of its reputation of the prison, upon reflection, is a nice if remote town with a good visitor centre with an exhibition of the Moors and Sir Conan Doyle, famous for his Sherlock Holmes tales. Dartmoor stretches for 22 miles north to south and 14 miles east to west. It is a source of many of Devon's rivers and the landscape varies depending on the mood of the weather. In the mist, the desolation a lone traveller may feel is intense, but when skies are blue, the varied colours of the heathers, gorse, grass and granite mingle to produce beautiful landscapes. The famous Dartmoor ponies can be seen frequently, as can many sheep, but the rest of the wildlife keeps itself well hidden in the wilds of the moor. Many schemes are in place to preserve Dartmoor for the future, 
including the use of buses instead of cars and the use of traditional methods when repairing walls, bridges and paths to maintain the beauty of the area. Such traditional methods include the upkeep of bridges, such as this one at Post Bridge. The bridge is known as a clapper bridge and is the largest one on Dartmoor at over 40 feet in length. Many others can be seen spanning streams across the moor. They are built from huge granite slabs which are supported on piers. The grooves seen here in the slabs of rock are left behind after the splitting of the huge boulders. In medieval times the grooves were cut using a pick and then wetted wooden wedges were placed in the grooves and as the water caused the wood to expand, the stone split. In more modern times, metal wedges have been used in a similar way to achieve the same results. The eastern moor is much gentler than the landscapes found in the north and the picturesque village of Ponsworthy is a perfect example of this. A cluster of thatched cottages surrounded by green meadows. More evidence of a clapper bridge is seen here at Dartmeet, dating from around the 13th century. Beside it, a more modern replacement has been constructed. Great efforts were made to build these bridges. Dartmeet is so named because it is here that the two principal rivers, the East and West Dart, converge. It is now a very popular spot for tourists. Buckland in the moor on the banks of the River Dart is in fact little more than a collection of unspoilt stone-built thatched cottages of chocolate box beauty which attract film crews and photographers alike. An example of the gentler side of the eastern moor. the Cathedral of the Moor, a landmark for many miles, for that is what the village church of St Pancras at Widdicombe in the Moor is known as. Disaster in the form of a thunderbolt struck the church on the 21st of October 1638, leaving 60 churchgoers injured and burnt and four people dead. In 1948, the parish of Widdicombe was presented with this village sign by Francis Hamlin. The green is a central feature, playing an active role for centuries in the life of the village as it does today. Further along is an ancient Saxon well that never runs dry and is one of the oldest sites in the village. One of the two inns is the 14th century Old Inn, almost destroyed by fire in 1977. The most unusual item here must be the 15-inch naval shell presented for the people's efforts gathering sphagnum moss. This was used for the treatment of wounds in the First World War. Now not a blacksmith shop, but the old forge flames still burn, this time involved in the artistic creation of attractive pottery and gifts where one can watch craftsmen at work. In this Aladdin's cave of a workshop, one is astounded by the number of different items covering every square inch. In contrast, the last will and testimony of the celebrated folklore legend, Uncle Tom Cobbley, hangs on the wall. And across the square, Old Glebe House, with its pixie wishing well and gift shop, is home for Uncle Tom Cobbley's chair. This is a peaceful, tranquil village, and perhaps always would be, but for one thing, the legend of Uncle Tom Cobbley and all going to Widdicombe Fair.
old uncle Tom Cobbley and all. Old uncle Tom Cobbley and all. Thousands of people flock here on the second Tuesday in September for this world-famous fair. Entertainment, stalls, food, craftsmen and the influx of people create an unbelievable atmosphere in this tiny village. Craftsmen create items while everyone works up an appetite. thirsty work at the fair for everyone, as a parrot would probably tell you, but not everyone is lucky enough to be able to go to the pub. But just along the road, one Uncle Tom Cobbley and all refreshes himself with a pint at the traditional Rugglestone Inn, one of the least altered pubs in England. Traditional maypole dancing, eventing and so-called terrier racing all add to the spectacle. Elaborate fancy dress, the exhausting race from the top of Widdicombe Hill and cups for various competitions all make the Widdicombe Fair an unforgettable day. Moving up Widdicombe Hill towards Bovey Tracy, we'll see Haytor, which stands 1,490 feet above sea level and provides magnificent views in all directions. These ancient rocks are popular with visitors today. Haytor marks the beginning of the Templar Way, a walk of 18 miles over varying scenery until it reaches Tynmouth at the coast. In places, the path follows the route of an ancient tramway and then alongside the Stover Canal, built by the son of James Templar. If it has legs, it probably lives up here. Near to Hayter were once granite quarries. The granite tramway can still be seen today. 
The carts were pulled by horse to the bottom of the valley in the canal, then they carried the stone to Newton Abbot for export. Such rock was used in the building of London Bridge. Here again, overshadowed by Hayter at the former quarries, if you look carefully, you can see the grooves in the rocks left behind when the stones were split, probably hundreds of years ago. Newton Abbott has been a popular town for centuries. It's here that Templar Way and the Stover Canal are once again accessible. Originally popular because it was midway between the prosperous towns of Dartmouth and Exeter and later due to the granite shipping. Finally it became a railway workshop town at the centre of the Great Western Railway. When this died out the town became another popular stop for tourists. Impressive Buckfast Abbey Towers above the town of the same name. The Abbey has been on this site for nearly a thousand years and was rebuilt on its original foundations in the 20th century. The amazing thing being that it took 32 years of labour to complete by only four monks. In contrast to the towering abbey, a small, well-preserved Methodist chapel with its unique character stands nearby in the grounds with a warm welcome for the visitors. Today, Buckfast Abbey is a thriving monastic community of 42 monks leading a life very similar to that of their predecessors 1,000 years ago. And the monks' expertise in designing and building stained glass windows helped make the abbey self-sufficient. Located almost in the centre of Devon and in the midst of the beautiful scenery of Dartmoor is the small town of Chagford. On its church roof is a mystical animal of some sort. No one is able to explain its presence. Chagford has that relaxed market town feel. The town can easily be missed when touring Devon as it's not directly on a major route. The very pleasant market square is the hub of the town with traditional pubs and shops. Despite its moderate size, Chagford is full of character and offers good accommodation and food. It was once a stannery town, of which there are just four. In these towns, the tin miners of Dartmoor brought their ingots to be weighed and hopefully to be given the king's stamp. Gorse-covered rolling hills, newly born lambs and swollen streams in the spring bring a sense of a new beginning after a hard moorland winter. Dartmoor has many links with a prehistoric past and there are many forms of evidence of inhabitants from early times. High on the moor to the west of Chagford, near the village of Gidley, lies Scorrell Stone Circle, one of the finest. When approaching this isolated circle, one cannot but wonder what ceremonies, events and secrets the stones have seen. As the mist shrouds the moor, it adds mystical aura to this special place. Back and forth across the moorland, there are many spectacular views, but few can beat the sight of the local landmark of Brentor Church. Not built on granite, like so much of the moor, but on a volcanic outcrop. The church was rumoured to have been built by a merchant whose ship narrowly avoided being wrecked, 
but it is perhaps more likely to have been the monks from Tavistock Abbey who actually founded the church. Coastal scenes of North Devon back onto Exmoor, with wooded slopes reaching down to the water's edge, and holiday resorts with long sandy beaches. Here clings to the cliff the village of Linton and its twin Linnoth. They are joined by road, but more interestingly by one of the world's most unusual railways. The Cliff Railway opened in 1890 and is the last working water-powered railway in Europe. It descends 500 feet on a track length of 862 feet, a gradient of one in one and three quarters. It works on a simple counterbalance system using up to 700 of gallons of water as ballast. Linton provides magnificent views from its lofty position. Linmouth, with the River Lynn running through its centre, was the scene of a great flood in 1952, where 34 people went missing, suspected drowned. The remains of lime kilns make a feature on the old promenade, standing as evidence of a major industry which once supported the livelihood of the local people and now gone forever. Linmouth has another dramatic story to tell of how, in 1899, a ship named the Forest Hill found itself in difficulty in Porlock Bay, some 13 miles away. And due to the treacherous conditions, the 12 oar lifeboat could not be launched. The decision was then taken to launch the lifeboat from Porlock. A dozen horses and up to a hundred helpers struggled to haul the lifeboat against all odds over Moorland and the Porlock Hills before the eventual launch at 6am the next morning. The Forest Hill and its crew were saved. The epic feat of extreme courage and determination of both the lifeboat crew and villagers was reenacted in January 1999 to commemorate this heroic rescue using the sister lifeboat as the original no longer exists. A toll is payable in order to see this wooded coombe in all its glory. The valley of the rock stretches to the west of Linton and is strange because the valley runs not down to the sea but parallel to it and was so probably formed during the last ice age. Many of the strange rocky outcrops have been given names over the years, such as the Devil's Cheese Ring, Ragged Jack and Castle Rocky, all of which provide spectacular shoreline views in all directions.
Every bay and cove has its own charm and the grass-covered cliffs at Woody Bay with its dramatic coastline and typically steep wooded hills surrounding it are no exception. Coon Martin is said to be the largest village in Devon and its other claim to fame is its main street of approximately two miles, the longest in the country. An unusual building here is a 17th century pack of cards inn, reputably built by George Lee. Financed from the winnings of a card game, this inn was built with four storeys, 13 doors on each floor and 52 windows. This represents the suits and cards in a pack and outwardly resembling a card castle. Walks among the rocky outcrops as the surf pounds the shoreline demonstrate the natural power of nature. Watermouth Bay is typical of many of the coves on this coast, but opposite is the historic 1825 Watermouth Castle, a top visitor attraction. Ilfracum, on the North Devon coast, is the largest resort. The town has a bustling harbour and some beautiful gardens set among beautiful coastal scenery. It is probably a combination of these things and fine beaches which has upheld Ilfracum's reputation since Victorian times. The beaches are plentiful in number, but the unique tunnels beaches are undoubtedly the most famous. These beaches, as their name suggests, are approached through tunnels cut into the cliffs, opening out onto spectacular views of the coastline. Family seaside resorts dominate the next few miles of coastline. Woolacoom, seen here with its superb surfing beach and cliff-top views, is a draw for families year after year. Lundy Island is sometimes visible, about a two-hour boat trip from mainland ports. A few miles along the coast is the three-mile curving beach of Saunton Sands, one of the best beaches in Devon. Barnstable and Appledore are towns with lively communities offering tourist delights as well as attractive alleyways and quiet corners. Each at Westwood Ho is a vast expanse of sand, but whilst the walk may be daunting to some, the surf at the end makes it worthwhile for the more adventurous amongst us. One of the world's unique villages on the North Devon coast is Clavelli. At the top of Clavelli, there's a visitor centre which charges an admission fee. This helps keep Clavelli well maintained and it's well worth it. The top is best approached by the hobby drive, which takes you through wooded slopes above the village. When the vehicle stops at Clavelli, donkeys become the favoured mode of transporting goods down its cobbled streets. These drop 400 feet in less than half a mile. Pretty 16th century cottages line your route and some provide a place for resting and yet another delicious cream teas. Novel ways of going about daily routines have to be invented in such a village and sleds play an important part in daily deliveries. A 
At the foot of the village is an attractive little harbour where visitors rest to summon energy for the walk back to the top. From the car park, a Land Rover service is available via back routes down to the harbour, beach and hotel. If you find it difficult walking up and down the steep cobbled streets, spare a thought for the local people who make their way up and down the streets every day. Clovelly can be seen as a tiny portrait of all that is typical to Devon. A place of many panoramic views which you will either remember fondly or seek out on future visits to Devon. Devon has a natural beauty in its countryside and yet it belies the fact that the people who have lived here have to adjust to many changes from farming to a fishing way of life and finally to accommodating tourists who flock to admire its beauty and enjoy its beaches. Mm -hmm.